intellectual stew where we are serving stew we're not sipping tea we try to have substantive conversation where we are spark uh into we try to spark thought we try to uh discuss things that will uh, enhance our community we want to challenge your thought processes and all of those types of things so if you're listening do me a favor um go to disco 100 radio on YouTube, when you get there, subscribe, and when you subscribe, you will be able to. Uh, you will be able to. Uh, <laughs> I'm tripping. You will be able to. Uh, that ain't me this time, Jay. That's you. That's me. Yeah. Uh, you'll be. <laughs> you got to turn your volume down. We'll be able to subscribe. But like we bring guests in the house, and they come in here disrupting things, and all of a sudden, we good. <laughs> We're gonna be all right. But no, you can go to YouTube. Go to Disco 100 Radio. And subscribe, and when you subscribe, you'll be able to see us in the studio. All right, now, if you have not gotten a chance to go and check out our website, I want you to go to www.theintellectualstew.com. Uh, go there, and you will be able to um, you'll be able to see us live. I mean, excuse me, you'll be able to see everything that's going on and you'll be able to see past videos. If you want to order any merchandise like the shirts that I'm wearing tonight, anything of that sort, you can go the, to the intellectualstew.com and you'll see that. Let me make a quick announcement now and I'm going to make that announcement again at the end of the show. I have started a, another uh, group on Facebook. It's called the Intellectual Stew Book Club. Uh, we are starting uh, reading Mary K. Morrison's book talking about soulmates dissipate we're starting with the first book so within two weeks we're going to read that and we'll be ready to discuss that i'm going to be honest i read it in a day and a half so it's a pretty good book and it's a real 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 easy read and we'll be discussing uh, uh interesting topic the topic of soul mates and um and i think all of us can learn something with regards to soul mates hey but guess what tonight i got my homeboy uh in the studio with me uh he's a little younger than i am but he uh he's nevertheless a homeboy. He's from probably one of the smelliest cities in America. He's from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. They hit you with a paper mill going in, Tyson in the middle, and a paper mill on the way out. What's up, Jay? Hey, what's up, man? Man, tell the people who you are. I'm Jay Edwards, uh, musician, writer, entrepreneur, um, church boy, homeboy from the country. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, glad to be here with my boy James and uh, lifelong friend. I've been a friend of his family. Our families are from the same community. Uh, yeah, so it's good to be here, man. So let me ask you a question. Why, why do you uh, why do you think I invited you on the show tonight? What do you think? What do you think made me think of you when it came to bringing people? Because I, I bring people on the show. Let me, let me just tell you a little bit about me. When I bring people on the show, it's because I've seen something. Uh, I don't bring, and if because I have a lot of people who ask me, can they come on my show? Personally, I think that's offensive to ask me unless you come in with an agenda. You understand what I'm saying? If you don't, have, and 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 don't take don't don't use the word offensive in the in a, in the wrong sense. I mean, it's kind of I think it's borderline arrogant, especially if you come on, you ain't got nothing to talk about. Right. You if you come on, you should have a platform. You know, you know, like I got one year, one young lady. She did she dives into mental health. So she wants to come on and talk about some things related to mental health and some tools that she wants to give people to help them be better. Now, I don't just want to come on and talk about, what, you know what I'm saying? Right. So, But base because me and you, we've not really ever had a conversation in a long time because you were a little younger than I was growing right. up. So mm -hmm. your people, we knew, we, our people knew each other. Right. But we've only had a couple of minor conversations through Inbox on Facebook. 
But what do you think it was that you did that I saw that would invite you, get you to come on my show? And I'm going to tell you if you're telling the truth or not. Uh, it's, it's probably because I'm a free thinker. Probably. Nope. Wrong. Um, you get three guesses, then I get Probably because I'm smart. Uh... You got one of them buzzers over there. <laughs> Although I do think you're very smart. I, 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 will, get, I, will, I will. Based on what I've seen, you are smart. Based on what I've seen, you are smart. Uh, yeah, I don't know, man. I I'm going to tell you what it was. What's that? Your parenting. Okay. Yeah. You, you, your, it's, I've watched you parent your children. Uh, throughout our pilgrimage, throughout Facebook, and I, right. I watched you. I ain't gonna lie, I watched your son put it on you one day, boy. Y'all was trying to do some push-ups and something, <laughs> and, and you got him in a push-up contest, man. <laughs> and he put it on you. Let me tell you something, Trey. My son's twenty-three. He's a little bit older you, but and Trey has never beat me running. Right. But I hadn't got. I didn't get a chance to race him when he got optimal. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I had slipped a disc in my back. So it's different. I never lost a race in my adult life. I really didn't. Right. I could. I man, I could run now. That when I got fast, as You're I got old. Country boy. Yeah, I'm yeah. a country boy. Right. You know, we used to run barefoot. Right. But I never got a chance to race him at full strength because I because I slipped a disc in my back. Right. You tried your son at full strength. At, at full at full strength. And he put it on you, bro. Hey, man. Hey, so I, I do it, man, just to just to push him and just to push myself. Like we get out when he comes home, we'll get out and we'll run. Mm -hmm. And I can't beat him in a sprint. So uh, I changed the game up. We go long distance now. Okay. And so, you know, he's pretty good about one one mile. But when I've been running three miles you know, consistently, mm -hmm. yeah, I, you know, I give him all he can take. You know. So you so but so wisdom is kind of kicked in at a certain point. So, cause when wisdom kicks in, it teaches you to choose your battles. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. And you, so you have to switch it up a little bit, man. Cause you lost on them pushups. Yeah. I lost. I know. I, <laughs> right. I he I put it on you on them pushups. Well, so, so the thing is, is that, yeah, we, we, we tried to do so many at a, in a certain amount of time. Uh, -huh. uh I do pushups, you know, on the regular, but his endurance is just on another level at this point. He's a college athlete. I never should, should have tried it. I did it for a joke anyway. I knew I would lose, mm -hmm. but I just want him to know that I'm not afraid of competition. I do the same thing with all of my children. I and teach them teach how to compete. You mm -hmm. got to compete in life if you're going to be great. If you can, it's a, Life is a competition, mm -hmm. whether we want to uh, agree or not. But, you know, you got to be you, you got to be at the top of your game. If you're starting a business, if you're going into the, the world of employment, you got to be you got to compete with the next man, in, you know, behind you. So. No doubt. Now, uh, and that, that's an interesting paradigm, because you raised a football player. Start your oldest, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, he's, so he's football. Mine's baseball. Different right. mentality. Yeah. Okay, because I remember uh, at 10 years old, he was playing for an all-black team. I hate to say it like that, but, you know, <laughs> you, you, know the, you know the stigma that goes with that a lot of times. They do a lot of yelling, a right. lot of hollering, all that right. kind of stuff. And I remember telling the coach, listen, if you holler at mine again, he don't play for you no more. Right. And the coach said, well, you know, when they get to high school, they're going to want to play. They got to be able to do this and do that. I said, if he don't want to play when he get to high school because he didn't like you, what difference does it make? Right. I yeah. said, and the other thing is, you coach 15-year-old basketball. This is 10-year-old baseball. There's a different mentality with 10-year-old baseball versus 15-year-old basketball. In basketball, if I get mad at you, I can bow you, shake you, dunk on you, whatever. But in baseball, when you got a, a curveball or a changeup or a right. fastball coming, your whole mentality has to be different. Do you agree with that? Correct. So did that make you more susceptible to using tough love? Um, Not necessarily. I mean, I use tough love with all, with all my children. Okay. So it's not, you know... You know, I let I let let mama love on them and hug on them and all that. I hug and I kiss, and she gives them a version of the truth. I give them the full truth. So I'm very honest. Uh, and my I, I have text messages right now. I can show you. My son, he's in college, and he he's, he'll send me a text message. He'll say, "Dad, thank you for raising me like you did, because now I can take constructive criticism and it doesn't hurt my performance and that type of thing." Because that's good. You, you gave me the honest truth. And so I was always his worst critic. I was always my daughter. She's a basketball player. Uh, she's no longer playing college basketball now. But I was always their worst critic. And I would let everybody, if my daughter scored 30 points, 25 points, whatever it was, and I, I'm like, yeah, that was good. But should have scored 40. 
So it was me just pushing them because I knew that that they would get all the praise and accolades from everybody else. I would tell them how proud I am. Every time I talk to my children, I tell them how proud I am, how proud how proud I am of them, and how much I love them. But also tell them ways they can improve. But you you need balance. Balance. Okay. Balance. See, mine. I like. I couldn't do. T- I, I did tough love on Trey. Right. And I think I almost lost him, but it was calculated. Right. Because I told my ex. I mean, I told her, listen, you don't. Let me get him. You know what I'm saying? I need him to be a hiding I need you to be a hiding place for him. Right. But let me get on it. And I did that. And and so a lot of parenting for him, with him was on the job training. Right. And yeah. I got some ifs. Oh, definitely. I got some ifs, man. You know, trying to be tough when I didn't need to be tough. You right. know what I mean? Like Vince, I remember he had a baseball game, man. He was out till one o'clock in the twelve thirty, one o'clock in the morning, right? So he didn't and he was in in uh what you call it? Uh magnet school. He was at the magnet school. So they had a bunch of work. Mm-hmm. And so that morning, he um, that morning he had an assignment that was due, and he didn't finish it because he was up so late at night. And all he asked me was, "Dad, can I stay home first period to finish this program?" No, nah, you should have had it done. Get on the bus. Da, da, da. I'm acting all tough. <laughs> that was dumb <laughs> because he ended up right. getting a B. Right. And if I had just let him wait an hour, he'd have got an A. Right. Correct. You know what I'm saying? And so those are things that you learn as a parent. You know right. what I'm saying? I started learning even like. With my baby, uh, in, uh, she wasn't a morning person. Wait for even with Trey first. Trey wasn't a morning person, right. and so he would mope around all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, move! You need to do. I'm doing all this yelling and stuff, making him mad before he even time to go. How are you gonna go to school mad? You right. know what I'm saying? And really be able to concentrate. Right. And I started to realize at that point that they're not morning children. So what I do because I'm up anyway. I get up by six. If they needed to wake up at seven, I'm already up at six thirty, six forty five. I just go in there and turn the light on. I wouldn't say a word. Just turn the light on. And then I walk out. Go downstairs, walk around the house, do something else. Then I come in. Hey, get up. That's that easy. And then they're, I know at that point they start rolling over in the bed a little bit. I go back downstairs, do something else. By 7 o'clock, after two or three times entering the room, they're up and they got a better attitude. You know what I'm saying? Right. But that took trial and error, if you will. You know what I'm saying? That look took making them mad sometimes. You know, yeah. I took almost losing them. Did you were you were you afraid? Have you ever been afraid that putting too much tough love on one of your children might cause you to lose? Uh, like one of them might not respond to it like that. Well, so so this is this is the thing, man. I think you have to be spiritual. Okay. When you're, when you're a parent, you have to be able to sense. You know, you can't parent all of your children the same. Mm. And so unpack that, please. Right. So so with Josh, Josh is like me. He's uh. He's a free thinker. He don't necessarily follow all of the rules. So for him, I had to parent him tough. Uh, I knew that, you know, his plight was different. Mm-hmm. But with Hannah, you know, and I, I use both of them because they're very close. They're 18 months apart. Okay. So I had to, you know, they pretty much were together the whole lives. So uh, Hannah, I raised different. Uh, I do some tough love, not a lot. You know, uh, and mainly because uh, she's a girl, uh, and it was important to me that as a man I treat her good, yeah, as, as good as I can. That's good. That's because, good. Because uh, if if I'm treating her good, that's expectation. Yeah, I set the expectation. I set the bar, so I don't have to worry about some knucklehead coming around and you know treating her bad, and, she, and it's acceptable. Mm-hmm. So. But, you know, with Hannah, you know, with the basketball thing, it was really hard with me because, you know. When you say the basketball thing, it's unpacked. The training, the training, the okay. training and the, the schedule. Mm-hmm. It, it was really hard to, as a girl, you, you have to treat her kind of different. Yes. You, know, you have to be a little softer. Uh, sometimes I wish that I could push her like I could push I could push Josh. But the thing is, is that, you know, like I said, girls emotionally, they handle things a little differently. So, oh, yeah. And I always wanted to maintain the, the the hardest part for me was to push him and also maintain a good relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can push him in school, push him in sports, and most most of the time, dads are the disciplinarians in the houses, right? And so it's hard to maintain also the the relationship where you can talk and have a good time because sometimes they carry it, the whole the fussing carries over to the next day or the next moment. With girls. With girls and with boys sometimes, but mainly with girls. You know, my daughter, 
if I make her mad, she'll be mad at me for a day. <laughs> Hold grudges, huh? Oh, yeah. I'm try- we trying to go bowling later. She's still mad about me oh, yeah. fussing at her uh, at training or whatever, So, or, or, or with schoolwork. And so for me, man, you know, you got to be very uh, spiritual when, it, when you, you, you're dealing with multiple children. They can't be... Um, parented the same it's not a template it's not it's I, t- I not. tell people all the time that they, they act like children have a template and everybody's supposed to be the same way right. and, so, and and i think one of the ma- most major mistakes we make is we want to parent children the way we were parented and right. think that that's enough yeah I, I make that mistake too yeah. i make that mistake uh, you know my, my, my stepmom used to put onions and eggs i hated onions and eggs <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So last thing I'm going to do is put, and then I remember my kids went to the house one day, she put onions in the eggs, and my kids didn't eat it. Right. The difference was we had to eat it. Yeah, we had, we had no we, choice. We had no choice. We had no choice. And my stepmama was a disciplinarian like that, so she didn't, if you didn't eat your food, you didn't get up from the table. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I'm sitting there eating some nasty eggs. I almost said the wrong thing. I was eating some nasty eggs with onions in them that I didn't like. You know right. what I'm saying? Now, now raising the children in my house, number one, we ate pretty much the same thing, <laughs> so we knew what we liked. And if we, if I made grits, if I made eggs, if I made bacon, if I made biscuits, right. you walk over there, pick what you want up off the plate, and make your plate, and go sit down. Right. And whatever was left over was just left over. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because guess what? The stuff that we tried to legislate wasn't even real r- rules that needed to be legislated. It was just us being bullies. It man. just being brought. Pretty it much. took me 40, how am I, 49? It took me 48 and a half years before I realized that I was abused growing up. Right, 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 right. <laughs> no, seriously, no. And I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm not saying it in a bad but, way. But, okay. I mean, our parents gave us what they what they gave us. They gave us what they gave and us. And they gave us man. what they knew. And so, you know, the next generation, we got to do better. Yeah. And so, for me, I just tried to do a little better. Hopefully, my kids take what I, what I gave them and... They do but but bit. understand this, and I'm and I'm, and, we, and we're gonna probably start trying to go another direction in a minute. Right. But understand that there's nothing wrong with the linear parental structure. There's nothing wrong with marriage. There's nothing wrong Absolutely. with heterosexual producing relationships. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but statistics show that children have a better opportunity in life when they have two parents. In their home, am I? Am I not saying that? Am I saying that right? You're correct. And in my household, I give my ex all the credit because she was probably miserable ten years long before she left. <laughs> and that's just real talk. And that's real talk. That's real talk. Because <laughs> I've been looking in that mirror, Jack. I told y'all that this, me and Disco talked about it last week. I said because, and this, and this is the analogy I use. I said because I know where my eyes are. I can brush my teeth without looking in the mirror. I know how to wash my face. I can tie my tie riding down the street. For a long time, I didn't even look in the mirror. And because I didn't look in the mirror, I didn't see what other people saw, mainly her. And so when she was steadily trying to tell me what I saw, (laughs) I'm sitting there like, no, you don't. But how do I know if I'm not looking in the mirror? Does that make sense? That makes sense. And so a lot of us growing up never really took that time to look in the mirror to see what we were actually producing. Because even if you don't look in the mirror, don't mean you're not producing a reflection. Correct. That's right. And, uh, you know, you said some heavy, man, uh, because a lot of times men don't listen to their spouse. And I was one of them, you know, didn't, <laughs> didn't listen. And so you go, you go years and years making the same mistakes and you kind of lead a trail away from from the relationship yeah. when he was giving you the tools to stay there and, and you know and cultivate the relationship. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. And this woman these days, they're not gonna stick around like mine stuck around all no. the time. No. Mine stuck around specifically to raise those children. I hear a lot of people say that they wouldn't stay, don't don't <laughs> stay for the children, don't stay for the children. Well that's your business. I get it. I'm glad she did because I wanted to raise my I got my son all the way through high school. I got my middle daughter almost through high school, and I got my uh, my baby into high school. So we were there for most, and we're still. Don't get me wrong, I mean, I'm up right up the street, so we're still co-parenting together and everything. But we make sure we focus on what, no the togetherness of you know what I'm saying. We're not we we gotta always have a unified front, you know. Right. Even if I don't agree sometimes, or if she don't agree, we try to have a unified front, you know. Right. Uh, so that 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 works. Have y'all how how did your divorce? affect your children's 
psyche mentality, their relate, their mannerisms. How did, did, did was there a change? Yeah, it was a change, uh, a noticeable change uh, with Josh. Um, like was he said, mad at you? Well, I don't think he would say he wouldn't tell me he was mad. Okay, but I could sense that he was angry with me. Okay, uh, he had, he definitely had a right to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, Hannah, she's different. You know, girl, different. Hey, the girl's different, girl's right? Different. She, she, <laughs> man, ain't flip the switch like she. Okay. Yeah, yeah. She, 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 she handled things differently. But Josh, man, he was, he was, he was a handful, and uh, he was going through all that. He was in Arizona with me, away from we were. Um, he was out there going to school at Chaparral High School his junior year. Mm-hmm. Um, had to pull him away for some things to get refocused. And so, yeah, man, you know, it was really tough. It was a lot of silence in the house, uh, a lot of tough conversations, a lot of me trying to break down uh, certain walls he put up around himself. Mm-hmm. Um, but it takes a lot of patience, man, to, to go through it. It takes a lot of patience. It takes a lot of a lot of prayer, you know, um, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do, uh, especially when you have to look in your child's eyes and see the pain that you cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really tough. It's really, really tough. And, and you said something with that whole patience piece because the generation we came from was you stay in a child's place and just don't and don't and, and, and don't question children. Right. And, and and you know what? That was good for that generation because right. I hear a lot of women nowadays. You know, uh, they say uh, they wouldn't take what grandmama took. Or they wouldn't do this. Number one, that ain't none of your business. <laughs> and it wasn't none of your business then. And it's none of your business now. Facts. And you didn't have the grace, nor the anointing, right. nor any of that to do what grandmama did. Because grandmama was cut from a whole different cloth than you're cut from. Right. So when you try to judge relationships today based on the sacrifices that were made for you then to have what you have now. You ought to be, you, the reason why you are where you are is because grandmama stayed. Right. Correct. Where would you be if grandmama had, you need to go thank grandmama and granddaddy for making, for staying. Right. Because we lived in a different time back then. They, they were a lot tougher. Uh, they had a lot more patience. Uh, and then I, I think the next thing is they didn't have all, all of the influences. They didn't have That's to good. turn That's on, good. they didn't have to turn on TVs and, and TV you know, they won a bunch of shows with, where women were leaving the relationship. Exactly. You know what I mean? Uh, and that, and that's that's now I'm I'm gonna cut you off. My bad. Yeah, but that's can. that's uh that's where I want to get to because I, mean, I I know how you think a little bit. So I mean, we're gonna play with that a little bit. All right. So we talk about TV programs. Programming. <laughs> Keyword programming. Okay. Right. So if we understand what it means to say that I watch a, watched a TV program, whenever you watch a TV program. There's action going on. Mm-hmm. And the action that's going on is what? Programming. Right. Because whoever is the programmer <laughs> has an intended goal Correct. whenever it airs a TV program. And unpack that for us, Jay. Tell them, tell them what that means. No, that's, that's correct. I mean, and so for me, uh, I try to, I, and I teach my children to stay in the moment, be conscious, mm-hmm. right? Uh, because you got so much information coming at you from so many different, so many different ways, from music, uh, TV, commercials, and all, all types of things. So, uh, and then you have YouTube now, and so you can get on YouTube and find anything that you want to find. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's it's a lot of information, and so for me, I live conscious all the time, you know, I, especially the last couple of years. So I control my information. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't watch the news. I don't, you know, I may go on a, and, and look at a news clip, you know, here and there. Uh, somebody may send me a, a news clip on Facebook. I may read it. Sometimes I don't, uh, but I try to control the information. And so, because I don't want to be programmed, mm-hmm. whether we know it or not, you know, what we watch, what we hear, we're downloading that in our subconscious. You know? And so, um, I think a lot of us, we live life haphazardly a lot of times, and we, we, we don't create filters in our lives to control information. Give me, give me an example of something that would potentially pro be, be negative programming for your children. Man, the, subtle, to something be, subtle. To be honest with you, the, the biggest thing I think is, is, uh, I can think of is music. Okay. Music. I mean, you know, my son, he would go to sleep with music in his head, rap music and all that. I used to make it make him take 
the the uh the headphones off when he when he went to sleep mm-hmm. he couldn't even properly rest you know uh as you download all this information we don't think we don't think that stuff controls us but it does it does and if you're not conscious it really controls you so you know i i'm just saying when i go lift weights you know i have a different response uh in my workout when i'm listening to uh 50 cent or whoever i'm listening to okay. right um it's a different different response you know what i'm saying I, I got more energy i'm more violent with the weights whatever it is mm-hmm. I can tell when I go a long time and I'm listening to the wrong things. A few years back, a few, few years ago, I used to listen to you know heavy rap music a lot, and my response was different. When somebody cut me off in traffic. I'm ah, that that was me. You felt yourself get aggressive. I felt myself being very very aggressive. Mm-hmm. So I I cut back. I stopped doing it. And so just me recognizing. And so I, I think a lot of it comes just being self aware, being conscious. You know what I'm saying? What's going on around you? But music is one of the biggest driving forces. I think. In today's culture, with violence, uh, with young men, that type of thing, and you know, I what mean, about reality TV? Re- I think reality TV has has its place. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think reality TV gives you the because it gives you the visual. Yeah, it does. You know what I'm saying? You see all these people that see people think that money and class kind of go hand in hand. No, you can go. You can have some money, drive a Ferrari, wear Versace. And still be just as ratchet and hood, cause you still in the store asking for scrimp. Right. Yeah, I mean money. That was that was look, look, that, that, that look that was a a calculated pause when I said scrimp. Yeah, oh. I, yeah I, I get it, man. I, I'm just saying, like for me, uh, I'm I'm way away from the money. Uh, I ain't never had none. So I'm I'm, I'm, in, I'm into value now. Yeah. You know what yeah. saying? What yeah. brings value. value? Yeah. Yeah, I'm into value, and so money doesn't always bring value. But 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 that's for somebody who understands money. Right. But a person who does, who's never had money, their whole mentality about that whole subject is different because they think they think money, having money is the end all be all. They think that because I I, I, mean, I never will forget. I used to man, people people would be surprised if I told you I used to own a shoe shine stand. Okay. And I used to shine shoes at a at a, a store at a office building in Buckhead. High profit. High profit. All profit. Yes, sir. It was all profit come to think of. It. And I ain't gonna lie, I, I made about a stack a week shining shoes between. Right. But people wasn't paying me seven dollars to shine shoes. They paid me. James right. Kirkland. Yeah. I'm that my value is much more than seven dollars. Correct. Right. So when I would walk in the, when I like if I'm sitting downstairs and nothing's going on, I had the uh security code. Where I could walk on the door, the floors that were locked, and I just walked by every lawyer's office and just point at them. They'd be like, "Come here," <laughs> and I take the shoe, walk them downstairs, shine, right. and bring them right back. They handed me on the average is ten to twenty dollars every time. Right. And I do that for two or three hours. I go home every day with two hundred dollars in my pocket. You know what I'm saying? Or else they would leave me a big bag of shoes downstairs when I got there. And if it was seven pair, and I knew that was hundred and fifty dollars a day. You know what I'm saying? Right. But it wasn't. It wasn't the service. It's what you just said. It's the value, right? Because they they wasn't getting Joe Blow to shine their shoe. They were getting me, right? And some days they would come in there. I never will forget. Sometimes they would come in there and uh, and and they would just close the door behind them and just walk in. I need to talk, James. I'm like what, man? I got this going on at home, and I got this going on at home. And I'm I'm like I'm just a shoe shine dude, but they want they wanted to talk to me. You know what I'm saying? And those conversations, a lot of times, I remember at least three or four times those conversations would end with a hundred dollar bill in my hand. You know what I'm saying? Because it was the value. It was the value. And when you possess that type of value, because you know who you are. Money comes easy. And not only that, it begins to translate to your children. Right. Definitely. Your children see life in a different way. Definitely. You know what I'm saying? Baseball and softball really helped my first two because it gave them a certain sense of structure. Right. You know what I'm saying? Trey ain't never had no bills. You know, he had never had any issues that would cause him to have a problem. And now he got probably a 750 credit score. You know, in mean, life, his lease on life is prepared. Man. You know what I'm saying? He's doing what he's supposed to do to he get started. That, into that Forex, man. man. Oh, my goodness. Bro, I don't even talk about that. No, he, may, he probably make more money than I make in Forex. But, Forex is beautiful. But they, kids figure it out a different way. And that's why, like, I had a conversation with my aunt last night. Uh, and I was telling her, we don't parent the same way. Right. Because I said, if that boy understands German and I only understand English, what do I look like trying to tell him how to speak German? 
all I'm going to do is try to learn a couple of phrases, you know what I'm saying, so I can kind of understand what he might be talking about to a little bit. But because he's mastered something on his level, I'm going to push what he's mastering. Right. And, and then, then he, he's had the, he has he's he, ha, he has the freedom yeah. to to kind of explore some things. I mean, you know, some things that, you, that we've been taught. I mean, we need to rethink. Uh, a lot of times, we we force our children into the struggle lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, before, I mean, they're, they're, then we, they can really figure life out. That's just struggling. say that again. Force them into what the struggle lifestyle. Like we're supposed to struggle. Struggle living. Yeah. So if we force our children out, it's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And we've done it in our culture for a long time. When you get 18, you got to get out of my house. That is dumb. Uh, and so we force our children a certain way. And so when I, when I, when I, I listened to the, the podcast with Trey and the Forex thing, I was, that's beautiful. Because, I mean, he's learning how to, to use money to make money. Yeah. Money is and he ain't even using his own. I, mean, I ain't telling his business. Well, yeah, he ain't even use his own money, well, yeah, man. But money is an instrument. <laughs> that's all it is. It's, it's a tool, man. You know? And so, yeah. But yeah, he, the thing, the thing is, is that you know, but he had the freedom to learn and pick up a, a, a skill, yeah, that he can use that that he can use for the rest of his life and change and change and his life changing, right, bro. He's up. He's so disciplined. He's up at six o'clock a.m. every morning for a podcast, mm -hmm. and they trade from six to nine. Mm -hmm. At nine o'clock, he's done for the day. Oh yeah. And so now he's studying real estate. He wants to learn how to invest in real estate and all that kind of stuff. Right. He's done. Right. He's done, bro. I told him the other day because he's about he was thinking about moving to Virginia with his girlfriend, but they they moved it out a little bit. But I don't mean to tell. I'm sorry for telling on your business, son. But uh, don't but, do uh, it. I, I, it ain't that bad. No. It ain't that bad. But uh, leave me alone, Anthony McCreary. You, you bad joker. You. But uh, Trey was so cold, man. When I moved here, when I moved here in 1995, I moved here with 118 dollars. And a trunk full of clothes. Lord have mercy. Bro, I hadn't finished a degree yet. Nothing. I came down here. I fell in love with my, my fiance then, my wife, my ex now. Came down here and visited that weekend, Labor Day weekend. Quit a job to come visit. Drove back to Antioch. Look, flew here. Drove back to Antioch. Preached my family reunion. <laughs> left Antioch. I'm talking about the Cheryl. Right. And drove back to Atlanta. Lord. Next day on Labor Day, went and found a job. Flew back to Memphis because I flew out of Memphis. Drove to Little Rock. Next day, I moved back to Atlanta. I came with $118 in a trunk full of clothes, and I've been here ever since. $118 a trunk full of clothes. Now, now that's crazy. Now, watch him. He's moving to Virginia if he goes. Right. Same age, 23 years old. I don't know how much money he got in his bed, but I'm a son, if you listen, I need to borrow $5. But uh, he, he's got much more than I had, okay? Got a nicer car. Right. Has a degree. He'll have a master's degree in about probably three months. You know, yeah. I think. Yeah. So all that's done. So his my sacrifice was his game. You know what I'm saying? I mean, their yeah. game. Yeah. I, I I I literally sacrificed a part of my life to make sure they could live. You understand? Does that make sense? Most definitely. I mean, that's how it's supposed to be. You saw me pull up in that little 2,200 cord out there, right? Yeah. And the, the mirror on the side broken everything. I don't care nothing about that car, man. Hey, man. That's but, he, but he drive a 2017 nice. I bought the new car for them. Right. And I made sure because I wanted to make sure they were straight. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I think as parents, that's some of the sacrifice. Now, you said earlier that there's no template on parenting. Now, Not what right. have you noticed? Because you got different generations. Right. You got like 20 and then 9, right? Right. So what's the difference between fact parenting that twenty year old, that nine year old, that six year old? What's the difference with them? Man, uh, so you know when Josh and Hannah was coming through, I mean, it wasn't really big. They were they were they the whole electronic situation was different. Like you know they had DVDs. If they <laughs> had that? a DVD, uh, DVD? player, I, I know I'm saying <laughs> they had a DVD player. I mean they were all right, but I now. Guess. The six and nine year old, they gotta have phones and iPods and and that type of thing. So you have you have to have much more hands on to try to limit the information they get. You know? Oh wow! Because I mean, you know, you have kids YouTube, but then you have to be very selective on what they watch, and you have to really kind of watch it with them. Because if not, I mean, you got these folk out here just trying to push everything on your kids, whether it's um, 
I mean, I, I don't want to go viral here, but I mean, whether why not? Uh, please. Well, go. I'm just saying that well, be careful, all yes. types of lifestyles yeah. on your children. So you, you really got to be careful. Uh, oh, we're gonna get into that. And, and it's 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 more stressful because you know kids are open to everything now. They have everything at their disposal. Yeah. You know. And you know what? And and and, and yeah, I used to hear an uh, old preacher say, "We lured Dr. Charles E. Williams of Little Rock, Arkansas." He used to say, uh, "We lured by satanic suggestion." You know uh, that that you know it's it's subtle satanic suggestions yeah. that that look and we and we were talking about programming a minute ago. You know, like I I like to watch certain shows, but certain shows that I watch, I have to fast forward through certain parts because I can't. I don't like to watch certain lifestyle. Don't 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 push that on me. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Like I'm watching like that movie The Shot. You ever watch that show The Shot? No, I haven't. Yeah, you watch it, and so on that show. There's a uh, there's a you know there are different dynamics of relationships, right. and there's one relationship where there's a transvestite, uh, a trans woman, or I don't know what's what's the correct term to say these days, but a trans woman in a relationship with a uh, with a man. There's a okay, yeah. There's a trans. There's a, and so they try to push that off. Now, you, are you watching shy? Yeah, so when they when you get on get, get on here and talk with me then for a minute. Come on, Disco. No, you don't want to talk about that. No, no, don't do it. Cause this, Disco will make us go viral. Get on that Disco. <laughs> so, so, but uh, but I, I don't want to go viral. <laughs> but listen, but with that trans, they, they they have a trans woman living in a relationship with a with a uh, dude that got off the show because he said he wasn't gonna be in a relationship. With, when Dre was on there, whatever his name was. He said he wasn't gonna be in a relationship with a trans woman. So he got kicked off the show. Well, he left the show. So, but this dude, other dude, he's on it. And he's actually in a relationship with a trans woman, and he's brought his little brother in, and his little brother's living in the house because he's raised his little brother. And they have a very candid conversation, and the little boy said, hey, I know what you are. That ain't got nothing to do with me. So what they're doing is they're, de- they're making it so, they're creating such a new normal that this new normal uh, seems so right. And I'm not saying what's right or what, whatever. I mean, yeah, whatever. Right. You get what you want out of. But that's what's becoming the new normal. Right. And that's what our children have to come to contend with. Our children are going to school now with people, yeah, very open to everything. You're absolutely right, Sean. But uh, uh, but th- they're very open to two mommies. <laughs> or uh, uh, Sally got two mommies at home. Or right. Johnny got two daddies at home. And all these kinds of things. And those are things we didn't have to contend with. Definitely not. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, now, I mean, it wasn't my problem. I mean, you be in the, in the, in the, no, nah, I ain't gonna say that. Well, you, go ahead and say what you're gonna say, because I almost said the wrong thing. But that's not just on that. We got that on Empire. Right. We got that on all these shows that are starting to really promote and perpetuate that lifestyle. Right. And that, to me, is really us being lured by satanic suggestion. Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, I, this, this is all I wanna say. Like, I don't think children should be watching those shows anyway. Okay. I, you know, they can pull them up on YouTube. I think every parent should have a lock, some type of lock or some type of um, filter on the kid's phone so they can't watch certain things. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I'm guilty. I never did that. I don't, I don't even know how. Right, right. So, I mean, there's some things out there. I, I, I can't really think of the apps now. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, there's some apps out there that can kind of, you know, give you some control. Um but you have to be careful even with the kids YouTube, you know, because they have, I forgot the show. There's an actual kids YouTube? Yes, a kids YouTube. But yeah. but there was a show on the kids YouTube where um, it started out like a, car, a cartoon, but then it was showing people kill themselves and stuff like that. So, um, you know, you got to be very careful these days. It's, I mean, the kids are, they're kind of flooded with information, man. Flooded with different types of ideas, lifestyles. And, to me, I think that, you know, it's the parents' role to put their kids in environments that, and I, I know you can't control every environment your kids, because I tried putting my kid in private school. Uh, my kids went to North Cobb Christian, and it was kind of, the, to me, it was the worst experience they ever had in school, at, at the Christian school. But, you know, I tried to put my kid in, my kids in a very good situation so that, put them around people that think like, that thought like we thought, that, that Talk the same values and that type of thing. Uh, but yes, it's really tough, man. Those are the challenges that we have with the younger children uh, because it gets worse and worse, you know, every year. You know, it gets, you know, it's always something new. It's always something 
you know, different going on uh, that we get, we have to feel that we feel that we have to block our kids from. But you know what's interesting, bro? That the different one of the difference is is uh you know you know the old African proverb it takes a village to raise a child. Right. Uh, we had a village. Definitely. The way we grew up. I mean, our families. I mean, I know right. your family was in the politics and you know and right. owned businesses and right. you know. So you came from good stock. I came from good stock. You know, right. we you know my family owned businesses. My grandmama had land. I mean, all those things were going on. So we, you know, we came from good stock. And if and I didn't get a lot of whippings. Me and my me and Chucky were talking about. I that did. Today. I didn't get no whippings. I got a bunch Dude, of them. my grandmother never whooped me. Hey man, I was so manipulative. I used to, I used to leave church with Chuck. And we used to sneak out of church and go over to your grandma's house and eat pound cake every Sunday. It, it was the kind of pound cake. Oh, no, she definitely never whooped me. Oh, my grandma, you talking about you talking about Miss Edna? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Man. But I'm serious. I never got. This is how it happened. If I got in trouble at Miss Mazik, you know Jamie Lee, Granny, Granny. Mm -hmm. If I got in trouble at her house, oh, yeah. I would call the other grandma, and she'd come get me before I got the whooping. And if I got in trouble at that house, then the Granny would come get me and. <laughs> I never, I got out of all my whooping. Me and Chucky, were to, me and Chucky were talking about, I'm thinking about doing a uh, a Summers in the Bluff show right. and bring on uh, my little brother and Chucky and some of us that grew up. Because, I man, you know, growing up in Pine Bluff was probably one of the best cities in the world to grow up and went back then the way we were with summer sports and UAPB and everything we had going on. Townsend Park right. and Oakland Park and shooting basketball. Right. I mean, we, and when Pines Mall really had a mall, I mean, we had some good stuff. Going. But my point is, we had a village. Right. So now they say, you know, it, it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. But the village is so messed up. Well, we don't, we, don't, we don't necessarily have a village. Most people don't even know their neighbors, man. Uh, well, but why do you think? I, I have a concept of why that is. Why do you think that is? Well, to be, well most of us don't live by people uh, that look like us, a lot of us. Once, once most of us get, especially black folk, once we get, Couple dollars, to, yeah, a couple more dollars. High enough then, credit school. Yeah, we move out the neighborhood and then we go across town to what's better. Um, there are some advantages to that. Yes, but I think we lo we lose a sense of community, mm -hmm. um, and so um, I think that's one of the that's one of the biggest challenges I had was trying to keep my kids, give them, keep them around culture, but take them away from the culture. <laughs> That's why I want to get you. Can, can I, I put an umbrella I, on that? I did not. I, yeah, you can. I, I didn't want to do it, but you know, at the time, I felt that I should. I should do it. Yeah, um, I get it. But it was a struggle. But that's the reason why the village is so messed up, and I'm not and not because of what you just right. said. But the, the the reason why the village. And let, I'm taking it a, a little bit further back. The reason why the village is so messed up. I know where you're going. Is because of the clash of cultures. Right. We as Africans, before African Americans, whatever. We were Eastern culture. We were far east. You know, Africa's far east, right? The farther west you become, the culture shifts from Eastern culture to egalitarian culture. So how we grew up in the country, a communal people, you know, the Edwards lived in this house, the Shaws lived in this house, right. the Maziks lived in this house, I mean, the Wilkinses lived in this house. I mean, all, and then everybody showed up at Big Mama's house for uh, Sunday dinners and for family reunions. That was a communal thing, right? right. But when you start to get become egalitarian, now your success is determined by a four-bedroom house, 2.5 children, a dog, a fenced-in backyard. Right. So we become much more individual in our mentalities, right? right? So now we don't lean on the village no more. Right. In fact, we don't want to even put Grandma and them in our business. Because we don't know who the village is. So yeah. you, you understand, you know, our families lived together since the early 1900s. Yeah. I mean, for a long time. So it's not like, you know, they just met each other. Mm -hmm. You know, we had generations of children to grow up together. Yeah. So... You know that's the difference, but you know if if I take my child, and because I get a few extra dollars, and I move to, you know, the suburbs around people, I don't. You have you have to learn the, your neighbors, and you, it's just a lot going on, man. You gotta you gotta build trust. That takes a long time uh, to build trust with somebody, and so I think it hurts us a lot of times when we leave our communities. But sometimes we have to leave our communities, especially when you're raising uh, black men. Black son. Uh, society has dictated in such a way right. that we have to leave. My son just asked a question. Maybe you want to answer it. It says he says, "What? Are, where are the all? Where are the successful?" He's asking on my Facebook page. Where are the successful 
Well, excuse me, where are all the successful black communities and what happened to them? Successful black communities? Mm-hmm. Um, so a, f- a few things happened. I, I think, you know, a lot of times, man. Go history. Go all the way back yeah, and come yeah, forward. Yeah, we got time. Yeah, so I mean, you can take little communities like Pine Bluff, man. Uh, you know, Pine Bluff, to be honest with you, and I, and I said it on my Facebook page, was the first black Wall Street. It was before it was the Black Wall Street. People before don't realize how, how how successful Pine Bluff right, is. Right, right. It was Black Wall Street before it was Black Wall Street. Mm-hmm. You know, and so uh, when I when I was growing up, you know, Pine Bluff had a bunch of successful Black businesses. Mm-hmm. Doctors, I think Doctor Johnson, those guys, Doctor Flowers, uh, Clifford Flowers, all those guys, and then then Rofe. we had yeah, Doctor Rofe, exactly. He's, he Doctor Rofe actually delivered me. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, um, but then you had people like Mr. Pointer, Pointer's Cleaners, and you had, I mean, it's a, I, I can keep going. PJ, all of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, PJ, PJ Johnson. Yeah, it was a bunch of people, man, that I could look to as black men um, that were pillars in the community as businessmen. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, a lot of times, you know, when that generation died off, you know, there was a shift, man. You know, we, we get more educated and we feel like, we need to go get a that, job. That's now that's that's the shift right there. Yeah, we, we feel like we, we need to go get a job, and then that's that's cool. You can go get a job, but we at some point we got to figure out how to start owning stuff again. And I, but I'm gonna tell you something though, because Trey asked a good question. Trey comes from my stock, so his question used to have innuendo. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So when you start saying something like, uh, "Where are all the successful black communities?" Like for instance, whenever a successful black community has been built in history, it's been burned. Down. White people burned it down, right? Pretty much because whenever they see us organizing and being successful together right. that's a threat now you make a good point you have to leave to an extent to, extent, yeah. to go and take care of your children i mean now you do because, now you do yeah but I, my formula for fixing the black neighborhood is if all the successful people move back that's right if every black if every black millionaire moved back to the hood the instant the neighborhood changes instantly because the tax bracket changes and once the tax bracket changes, then pricing changes. When pricing changes, now you got to give us more money for education. Now you got to give us more money for resources. Now you really got to police us. You feel what I'm right. saying? So that so I think in order for us to really, really, really be successful is when all of like white flight made a U turn and came back. Right. If we would just stay, Fair Housing, Fair Housing Act of 1967 said we can move out, and, and it's legal for us to move out. Mm-hmm. But that was a trick. Because you, what you did was you weakened our infrastructure. Correct. Because now the people that were in the neighborhood, because that was the only place we could stay, there were doctors there. Mm-hmm. There were lawyers there. Right. There were teachers there. Right. There were judges. There were professional people right. there. But the ones that were allowed to move mm-hmm. were the successful ones there. They did a study on Robert Taylor Holmes in Chicago at one point before they tore it down. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do you realize that like ninety percent of the people there were single black women? Wow. There were no teachers, no lawyers. There were people sitting there raised, and these ninety percent of black women, guess what they're raising? Black boys. Right. Right. So where are the successful communities? Now, because because whenever we we think we got now, if you go to the South Side of Atlanta, you got some Negroes that got some money. You know what I'm saying? And and they got some nice. I, did I say yeah. that? I'm sorry. No, no. Yeah, I, I did. I said the right thing. No. No, yeah. Did. So you got some of them that got some good money and everything. Right. And they're doing their own thing. That's why I like the West Lakes. That's why I like the uh, May. You know Benjamin Mays because they stayed in their neighborhood. Right. And they're living in two and three hundred thousand dollar houses. Some of their kids riding to school in Mercedes and all these types of things. But then you got some of us, like you said. Who went to the suburbs? Right, right. And we put our kids around, and these kids ain't even used to. Trey, I never will forget. I took Trey on Camelton, and he listened. Trey, I'm sorry, I'm doing this to you, bud. But uh, I took him on Camelton Road to JJ's Rib Shack one time, <laughs> and Trey might have been six. And man, if I, I'm telling you, uh, yeah, appreciate that. Uh, man, uh, he, uh, I'm a uh, he, uh, when he was in the car. He's looking at these people around him. And these are crackheads, drunks, all these things. And my children are clairvoyant. Right. I think they see spirits. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I really do. I know I do. I mean, I, I used to. Right. So, right. I mean, my children can see things because they prayed too and all. You know, so they, so when he, I came back to the car, he was laying on the floor. I'm ready to go. Get, let's leave. Let's go right now. Dad, I want to leave right now. I'm like, no, I'm going to get these real tips. Right. No, no. I messed up and left him in the car. I shouldn't have left him in the car. 
I'm his daddy. Right. I covered him. And he felt uncovered for that moment because he's in, a, in an uncomfortable environment right. that he's not used to because I've raised him in the suburbs. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah, but for, for me, man, I, even though my children were raised in the suburbs, I always took them back to the bluff. Nah, I, ain't do, I didn't do that enough. I, 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 I took them. I took my kids to the south side, you know. To and then when they play sports, I, I made them play against the teams from the south side. Did you? Yeah, I did all the time because it was just a certain type of toughness. But base, you talk about baseball though. Well, well, <laughs> you know what I'm well, yeah, baseball, baseball, baseball different, different yeah, but basketball, yeah. football. Because all the kids were on them black teams, right. they, they had good teams until they were twelve. Right. We wouldn't even be on be able to be yeah. on those teams. Right. But bro, we got on that big field and, and baseball IQ kicked in. Right. Shoot, that Trey Trey was be the man on the field then. You know right. what I'm saying? But I, I get it. I get it. But there's such a difference in the way we were raised. And the way they were raised. Okay, let, let's let's go back twenty years. Uh, let's let's let, well let's go back ninety three. Ninety three. Uh, that's really when mass incarceration really started to really take off, and we and it was happening right in front of us, and we didn't even realize it because that dime rock was given a mandatory ten automatically, right? Well, I mean, a lot of people didn't realize, but you, I grew up different from everybody okay. else. Okay. Because. Uh, because of my granddad, politicians. So okay, yeah, Gene Edwards. I kind of, I kind of. Gene Edwards. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of grew up different. I, I got, I got. So my granddad would give me a different perspective. Uh, he had, he had amazing, amazing foresight. You could see, and so that's one reason why I am like I am. I anticipate things. Okay. And so I just left Johnson and Johnson because I knew they had mandatory vaccines coming. Okay. And so, foresight. You know, he taught me to live and or anticipate what's coming. Okay. And so. Um, you know those those type of things, and so you know, uh, but you know, at the time, we kind of knew what was going on because I would have conversations with him. Okay. You know? So he kind of knew what was going on, and and the thing is, man, with the whole mass incarceration thing, you know, that was a that was a all that was all a trap, man. Oh, it still is. It was, it's still a trap, but it was really a trap then. That was all orchestrated, you know what I mean? So, you know, it was. I think it was really. Uh, it's my book. Oh yeah, I read this. Yeah, well, that's that's my book right there, man. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, yeah. another one you just get is the color of law. Okay. Yeah, get that too. The that, color that, of law. Yeah, the color of law. Somebody put that in the comments. The color of the law. Color of law. Book. Okay. Yeah, I, I I I wanted to bring it with me so I can, but yeah, it's gonna talk about. Are you coming back? Trust me. Man. It's gonna talk about the real estate game and how we got into the situation we're in now with property value and. You know, redlining and that type of thing. So. Oh yeah, that, that's my subject. My my undergrad is in a. Uh, is in the uh, international economic, I mean, community and international economic development. So we used to talk about city planning and right. building and uh, all those kinds of things. But yeah, so yeah, because my my pops told me when I was fifteen that the black male would become extinct, and one of the ways he said it would be would be through the prison system. You know what I'm saying? But my point in saying that because people and I say this a lot on this show, a lot of people don't realize how many black men were exported out of communities oh, and be. warehoused in warehouses. Yeah, we were gutted. Yeah, we were gutted. Yeah, you, you look at fr from from nineteen ninety three to two to to the early two thousands. Twenty years, two thousand, but right two thousand ten, somewhere right there, right. Well, well, I'm just saying how many how many guys were incarcerated from from nineteen ninety three, and, and you know ten years, well two thousand and three. Mm -hmm. you, you're talking about it was like. Whatever the number, I think it was like two hundred thousand. It was two million in that twenty year period. Well, yeah, it, yeah. yeah, it was, but yeah, ten times. Yeah, we started around. It was like two hundred mm -hmm. some thousand yeah. black men.